And so what's on my heart is to bring truth from the scripture about the rules and the laws of the harvest. We're, we're in the season of harvest. This is the season that, that we celebrate harvest. And so it should be easy for us to, easier for us to understand. There, there's, there's an idea or ideas that are being perpetuated in the body of Christ uh, in our day and age that I think do an injustice to what the, the, the laws of harvest are. But harvest is very important for us. Now, uh, as you're going to see as we work through this over the next couple of weeks, it may be three weeks worth at least, um, the harvest, seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping, unfortunately, it's, it's perpetuated, it's explained or it's taught in a lot of circles on how you get from God by using the system that God gave us. And it, it's, it's almost taught like you, you, you figure out how to work the system and then you, you give so that you can get. And, and I just, I think that we need to be cautious with that mindset that there, there are rules that he's given us. There, there, there is a formula that we have that we should function within. And, and I'm just going to kind of give you up front what I believe the harvest is addressing the most. God's not necessarily looking for seed from you and I. The seed that he's really wanting, what, what he's really wanting us to sow is our lives and our hearts. Because when he has our heart fully, the rest of this is just And unfortunately, we live in a day and an age where the heart tends to be almost the last thing people are willing to sow. It wasn't long uh, I was listening to a service uh, where a gentleman was preaching and he probably spoke for an hour and he, he talked about everything that God is about to do in the body of Christ. And it, it, he put it all on God. God is about to do this, and God is about to do that, and God is about to do this, and he's fixing to do that. And, and it, right after he was through preaching about everything that God was going to do, then his, his partner, his wife, stood up and gave a prophetic utterance while she received the offering. And here's what she said, that if you don't give to God, God cannot give to you. And I'm thinking twofold in that. I'm thinking, wow, you just contradicted everything that your husband just said, and you just told a lie on God, that God can't do any, anything for you until he sees you give money. And, and I'm not going to lie, I, it took me a little while to calm down from that because I'm, I'm tired of the body of Christ being abused like that. That's not the God of the Bible. Can I get an amen? amen. There is a principle of seed, time, and harvest of which we are going to look at. There is a truth of sowing and reaping. But it is not about figuring out how to get from God what it is that we want. It's about being obedient to God according to His will and letting God take care of what we need and what we desire. And the truth is, every time God can outthink you and I. I don't have to waste my time trying to manipulate God's system to get out of God what I want from God. I'm learning at the young age of 51 and a half years old that if I can find a way to be obedient to his will and trust him, what he brings into my life is far going to surpass anything joyful and great that, that I could think up myself but by just letting his blessings come into my life. Can I get an amen? And, and I, I wish I could say that practice is easy. It doesn't. It preaches pretty, pretty good, but it practices a little bit harder because we're, we're really asking people in our lives, let go of your uh, expectation of what you're demanding God to give you because of your service. Have an expectation in prayer, but let God work and, and just trust him. And so um, tonight I'm going to start with a passage of scripture that's going to be the foundation for uh, uh, the, the laws of the harvest that I would like to, to discover or discuss in the weeks to come. And I promise you that this can be life altering when we've learned that we are part of a system that God is asking us to put our trust into, that we don't have to get creative in trying to get out of God what we think we want and use his system against him. 
We don't need to do that. Uh, faith is not figuring out a way to get God to move on your behalf. Faith is learning to stand in what He's already spoken and let God be God. Amen? And, and the Bible does tell us that, uh, it encourages us that God, He knows, before we even really speak it or even think it, He already knows what we have need of. And, and He's got things lined up. If we can just find a way to stay in His plan um, and seed time and harvest, the laws of the harvest are really part of that system. Um, along the way, I, I want to convey to you something that we all really know, but maybe we just tend to forget, that bringing a harvest isn't always the easiest thing. And I'm speaking from the perspective of God, too, here. Um, you know, um, over the last year or two, Renee's had some success in her garden. And, she, you know, she's proud of, of where it's at. And, and there's been times she'll post pictures of her tomatoes or some of the, some of the, the, the harvest from uh, the time toiled in the soil. And, and she's getting, you know, certain people that are saying, man, that looks awesome. What did you do? And, and sometimes they're, they're asking the same way I would ask is, well, let me just find out what soil you grab and let me go grab some of that soil so I can have it too and put my seed in the ground and water it and, and get what you've got there. And here's the truth. The last year or two, the, the garden's been awesome. I'm not going to lie. The garden has been amazing. The years before that, the garden was horrible. It was a mess. No, I mean, well, I'm just in trouble. It was horrible compared to what it is now, sweetheart. Because the first year, it didn't work. First year, we were like, I, I thought this, was the, are you sure you planted what was supposed to come out? It just that didn't look like it. But, but what we did is we kept working the soil. And, and then the next year, we, we worked the soil and, and we added things to it. And we didn't change the soil. You've got to hear me. We never changed the soil. We never got mad at that soil and threw it out and went and got different soil. We, we stayed with the soil and we kept adding to the soil and we kept working the soil and we kept turning the soil and we kept bringing nutrients into the soil. And the soil at one time that was not able to produce is now a soil that it's, it's almost like you throw the seed in there and poof, it doesn't matter what happens. This great fruit comes out of it. This great vegetable comes out of it. Yeah, because we, we've spent time working the soil. How, why would we dare think that God wouldn't expect us to stay the course in our own lives and give him a chance to turn the soil, to prepare the soil? Because his, his seed is that important and he wants to bring forth in our life. But I'm just going to be honest with you. Most of the time, we don't sit still long enough to let him do it. And if it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen in our timeline, we get mad and we turn the soil and we, we go a different direction. And God's saying, oh, man, I, I'm trying to work something into you. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to change things. And so the key to, to understanding the harvest is first understand you and I are the soil. We are the soil that he's trying to do something in. In order for us to do that, we need, we need to stay the course, sometimes slow things down and admit, maybe this season isn't the season I'm going to see everything I want to see. Maybe this is a season for God to just prepare me. And maybe next season isn't that season. Maybe, maybe I'm two or three seasons out, but I'm going to stay the course because the, the product is going to be worth it. Can I get an amen? And, and, and this is, you know, when we, when we talk in terms, when we talk about the church, we talk about the body of Christ, we get into 1 Corinthians 14 where we're wanting the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit to work. Twice in that chapter, the Apostle Paul says, let everything be done decently and in order. And that word order is important. That God has in order. It, 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 we're going to address, not in the seed time and harvest, we're going to address some topics down the road, like I mentioned Sunday, some very important topics that are, are in great debate today in the body of Christ. And there's, there's great confusion and there's great misconception in it. And we don't, I don't want to weave around the word. I want to work through the word. And that means if we have to address difficult topics, we're going to address them in love. Are you with me? 
One of those is the roles of men and women in society, in life, in church. And there's a misconception about roles. And here's the truth. God has an order for the family unit in the home. Can we all agree? Why would we dare think that he does not have the same kind of order for the church and the same kind of order for society? God is a God of order. And so when it comes to the harvest, this isn't a free for all. This is, I'm not trying to throw you some keys out there, how you can get a hold of these keys and this formula and you can throw them back in God's face and get what it is that you want out of it because he said, the, no, there's going to be order in this because at the end of the day what god wants for from from you and i most is not money not time not those are all good he wants you he wants your heart he wants it fully and totally and sometimes that is fleshed out not in attending a service here and there sometimes that's fleshed out in being obedient to him for seasons as as he's grooming and changing the older I get, I have one side of me, I have this urgency to get the gospel out there because there are people that are dying and going to hell before our eyes and they need to know Jesus. On the other hand, I have a real peace that has been being built up in me to not get into a big old hurry with God because God knows what he's doing. And there's some amazing blessings along the way that he's trying to work out through us that we might be going so fast we miss. I think seed time and harvest, the laws of the harvest, sowing and reaping, I, I think that we need to slow this down just a little bit and ask the Holy Spirit to bring us revelation in this. Is that okay with you tonight? So, no, there's only like three of us. So it's, it's okay, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to start tonight, let's go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, and I, want to, I would like to use this as uh, part of a, a, a foundation for presenting uh, 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 the truth of what, what the laws of the harvest really are. Now, we're going to look at some parables that Jesus has taught us. And I, I, I really wish I could convey to the importance of the gospel when it says it's good news. The gospel isn't just um, uh, words by which we can find, follow, and be saved through. The gospel is so much more than just life beginning, and life beginning is awesome. You know, there's about to be a baby brought into this world. Over the last two or three weeks in our church alone, we've had children born in this world. And it is an exhilarating thing to be a part of, even though we've experienced it time and time again. And as excited as we are in our hearts, just because the child is here now doesn't mean all is well and it's over. Ah, he's here now. Let's, let's go. No, now there's this expectation that life is here. Now we get to see the better part, growth in that life. We get to start experiencing all the things. Are you guys with me tonight? Why would we look at the, our spiritual walk as any different? The end of the road isn't salvation. That's the very beginning to this thing. And what he's trying to do is work out in us his image of his son. And it starts at salvation. It starts at the beginning of faith. And so the Gospels, the, the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is not just the story of Jesus. It's chock full of principles that we call parables that begin to paint a portrait of what the kingdom of God is going to look like. The kingdom of God, of what we're all pointed toward, that when Christ returns, he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth. And it's, it's this, a lot of the principles point toward what that kingdom is going to be like. Now, I believe that part of our job as the church is to bring as much of the kingdom of heaven to earth through the church as possible by living out these parables, by fleshing out these principles, by taking what he's taught and trying to emulate him in our life, not just the story of Jesus, but the principles in which he's trying to build his kingdom through us. Can I get an amen? And, and so we, when we look at his parables in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we, I challenge you in this area. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to teach people what I've learned about Bible study along with preaching and, and encouraging people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I have four questions, and, and it's not limited to four questions, and it's not the extent of just four questions. It's, it's just four questions I start with. Sometimes I ask more than four questions, but the, if you will just get into a habit when you're reading the Bible, if you'll just get into a habit of just asking yourself these four questions when you're reading a passage of Scripture, I promise you the Holy Spirit will begin to illuminate more truth to you. There will be revelation that comes. And maybe some of you already do this. If you don't, I just encourage you to practice this. First question is you have to ask yourself, who is the author of the book? Okay, let's not, let's not be Mr. Vague right now. Well, it's always the Holy Spirit. Well, of course it's always the Holy Spirit. Let's get a little more uh, uh, de defined here. Who's the author of the book that you're reading? Because it, 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 in some cases, that question and that answer is going to be a twofold answer to the question. Some books, some chapters in the Bible, there's actually two different authors. Like the book of Matthew, Matthew is writing this, or the book of Mark, John Mark is writing this, but there's portions of scripture where John Mark or Matthew or, 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 or Luke or, or John, they may be authoring the letter, but they're also quoting uh, actual words that Jesus spoke. So, you, so in, in this case of what we're about to look at, you actually have two different speakers or two different authors. You've got Mark, who's, who's literally writing the letter, and then you have Jesus of who he's writing what Jesus said. So that's question number one. Who's writing the letter? And do your best to understand. It's important to understand who's writing to the best of our ability. When it comes to the book of Hebrews, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work past that one. Let's, let's just put that one on. Well, the Holy Spirit wrote that one, right? But, but most other books, we have a really good idea of who the author was, and especially if they address uh, the, the person that they're writing about. Jesus is speaking. Mark is writing. Okay, question number two, who's the audience? It's important. Don't think just because you're reading the Bible that what's being said is exactly to you for you to go and, and emulate. If that's the case, then tonight I'm going to start a brand new movement. Thus saith the Lord, God spoke to Noah in the book of Genesis to build an ark. I think we need to start a ministry and we're going to build an ark because he did it in the Bible. We're going to do it today because God's speaking to us through Noah. So I'll see you guys in about 100 years when you get your ark built. We'll come back together. No, we, we know. We know. God is speaking. Noah is receiving. That is for us to understand but not emulate. He's not commanding us to go out and build an ark. But we need to know it because it's part of the history. Are you hearing me? You need to know who's writing and you need to know who's listening. Question number three. It's important to understand what they're talking about. We, we've got to identify the topics in which is being discussed and we do that in paragraphs. We, we look at the paragraphs because it, the, the Bible has these points it's trying to make. And, and there's usually a reason. Very little. Please hear me. Very little does the scripture scatter shoot in its context. God, God is not speaking and hitting 50 topics in, in one paragraph. We do that. I'm bad about doing that. God's not a scatter shooter. God has a point. And, and, and when, when the Holy Spirit inspires somebody to write, there's usually some structure behind it and there's a point. And it's really once you start understanding your end point, it's not that hard to stay on point when you're reading the context of the scripture. And we've identified who the author is, who the target is, what they're talking about. Then question number four. Okay, once you've identified the author, the audience, and the topic, now you ask yourself, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to us? Is this something that is descriptive for us to just know? God commanded Noah to build an ark. He didn't really tell Noah exactly why or what was going on. He gave him dimensions. He gave him an idea, cut him loose, and told him to build this ark. There was a lot of unanswered questions in that thing. He had no idea what it was going to happen. He didn't tell him it was going to rain. They never saw rain before. He just told him to go build an ark, and it took him 100 plus years to do this. It's, it's descriptive to you and I, because he's not telling us to go do this. Some scripture is prescriptive. 
as we read it, we've identified the author, we've identified the audience, we've identified the topic, and then we make the application to us, we find out in the topic, oh, this is something that he's needing us to apply in our lives and to emulate. Are you with me? It's very important to understand just at the minimum, those four questions on every passage of scripture that we have. That alone, I could shut tonight's service off, and if you listen to me, that alone can change your life on how you read the Bible if you just ask yourself those questions. Your, your Bible study can go, I mean, sky high, uh, through the roof. So we bring it to this. We're, we're looking at the, the parable that I'm about to share with you. And so I would like to go to Mark chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 26. We know that the majority of the book of Mark chapter 4 has to do with the importance of God speaking and his words are seed. That the seed lands on soil. That if we don't do something with his seed, then the enemy will come and try to steal, to, to twist, to pervert the seed or the word of God so that it doesn't create the change in our life or bring the effect in our life that God intends for it to bring. We know that from studying the, the first part of Mark chapter 4. Then there's this wonderful little transition where Jesus, while explaining this to the disciples uh, in, in, in the, the, the mid-verses, before we get to verse 26, he goes as far as to say, nobody takes a lamp and puts it under a cover. And he goes on to talk about even more about the importance of sowing a seed and reaping a harvest. Then he gets, just as Jesus speaking, and he's predominantly at the first speaking to his disciples. We know this is unto us because we become the church in this. And these principles are to be carried forward. Verse 26. And he said, this is Jesus speaking. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields its crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts the sickle, puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So in just these few verses... We see a principle that I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to the church, an important principle about harvest, seed time and harvest. Breaking it down in just these four little verses, we see planting seed. We see overcoming a problem. I'm going to explain what that problem is here in a second. We see that they are allowing the process to take place. And then we see that they are being prepared to produce in due season, okay? Uh, this, this has very little to do with our efforts outside of obeying God, trusting God, being patient with God. This has everything to do with God's effort. And so uh, let me explain. It, first and foremost, we, see, we know that this is a principle that's for the body of Christ because he starts off in verse 26 and says, the kingdom of God is as, and then he goes on to explain the parable of the, the seed and the sower and, and what happens. But I want to I just stop down for a second. We're talking about a parable of Jesus Christ in the book of Mark where he says the kingdom of God is like this. So, so this, what Jesus is doing is he's, he's painting a picture, a portrait before the eyes of his hearers, which is now us. And we, we need to let this, this picture fully get painted. And this is where now on this idea, we can, we can leave this text for just a moment. And I just want to go to the book of Matthew for just a moment. And I just want to go to chapter 13. If we, if we can walk to the book of Matthew chapter 13 on this idea that Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like this. And he's about to, to give a description of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. So, so we've got a lot of people today in, in, our, in our prophecy circles, in, in the circles of, of end times 
uh, teaching where, where everybody's trying to describe what's going to happen in, in the end days. And there's always this, this question of what is heaven going to be like? And then people will go on these, these, you know, long explanations of what heaven's like. Then we'll even refer to somebody who, I'm not saying they didn't, I'm not saying they didn't, I'm just, I had a dream, I was in heaven for 15 minutes and here's what it looked like. Okay, I, I, I'm going to follow to the Word of God. I'm not saying they're, they're, they're not being truthful. I can't build my doctrine and theology based upon somebody else's experience and dream. Can I get an amen? Uh, that, can help, that can help encourage me in a moment, but I, I can't build my doctrine of God on your experience. And you better not be building yours on my experience. You, uh, my, my experience should be uh, but to do one thing, encourage you or, or help you along the way. Our, our doctrine, our understanding, our theology needs to be built by the Word of God. And so we use the Word of God to build this. What, what is heaven going to be like? Let's start painting the picture. This is like the kingdom of heaven. This is like the, the kingdom of God is as. And here, here's what God is trying to build. So we get to Matthew chapter 13. And in Matthew chapter 13, we have several parables that are, that are put forward that cover a variety of important topics, okay? Not scatter shooting in verses. He takes the whole chapter and he begins to just describe these different things. Like we, we have an understanding of uh, wheat and tares that grow together, okay? Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, give us this parable of the wheat and tares. And the message behind that parable is at the end of the age, the truth, being Jesus Christ himself and the word, will divide humanity into at least two classes. Two classes, not at least. Two classes. Righteous and unrighteous. Righteous and unrighteous. There's not going to be a third class. Halfway righteous, partially righteous, almost righteous. Righteous and unrighteous. This is what the kingdom of God... There, there's no middle ground with God on this. He's a God of decency and order. Why would he expect order? Why would he have order in the kingdom of God of which we're going to and not expect that we're working, supposed to be working order here too? That's why we cannot, we can do it in love, but we cannot compromise the truth of who we are and what we are. God made man and woman and that's it. Amen. Nothing in between. <laughs> Male and female. Why? Order. There's supposed to be godly order. Amen. I'm not going to meddle on that. But, but Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 are the parable of the, the, the wheat and the tares. But he starts that specific parable off by saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. Then he gives us this parable that teaches us that at the end of the age, there's going to be the division of the righteous and the unrighteous. You're either with God or you're not with God. There's, I'm sorry, there's no middle ground in this. You're either for God or you're against God. Can I get an amen? amen. Then, then verses 30, this is all Matthew 13. Okay, the kingdom of God is as, and it starts painting these pictures. Verses 31 and 32 give us the quick parable, which becomes an axiomatic truth in the body of Christ of the mustard seed. You see, I am a faith preacher. I believe one of the most important top topics in Scripture is faith. We're developing our faith, not so we can move God's hand, but so we can get on the page with God. I want God to be pleased with me. I, I want God to be happy with me. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. When he comes back to earth, he's not going to be coming back to earth and checking the roster of who was in church all the time and who was not. That's important. He's going to be coming back to see who has faith and who, who, who does not. Are y'all with me? And we've got to learn how to have faith in God. And I'm talking about the kind of faith that takes him at his word, no matter what the circumstances say, no matter what the situation is, no matter what storm is raging, what's on the inside of us should be growing faith. So I, I've been kind of, my mind has been all over this for, for a little while. And I'm putting up posts like, you know what, in, in all reality, I'm not, I'm not focused on being successful. I'm just striving to be faithful. 
Because I'm, I can, I'm convinced that if I can find a way to be faithful, whatever success that God wants me to have is going to follow my faithfulness. Are you guys with me today? I'm not trying to win in situations. Huh? I'm trying to strive to worship Him. And I, I want to be able to stand before Him and, and, and worship knowing that, that I can be a hot mess that He's working on, but I'm, I'm worshiping and I'm trying to be faithful. Are you guys with me tonight? The mustard seed. He says the kingdom of heaven is like this, and He gives us the mustard seed. And the principle behind the mustard seed is it's supposed to be growing. It's not just God. Well, God just wants to give you this little tiny mustard seed. If you just have the faith of that little mustard seed, that's all God needs from you. And, and you just show that little bit of faith and whip that little bit of faith out anytime you need something, and, and then God will do the rest. I mean, yeah, there's a truth to that. But that was not his intention. His intention is that we take that very little that he gives us and put it in the ground and begin to grow it and add to it and watch it grow and grow and grow. And that, that little tiny faith will become great faith one day. That little tiny faith can take us to where God wants us to go by trusting him in the same manner that Abraham trusted him when nothing else made sense, but God told him he's going to be the father of a multitude. Well, I believe you, God. I believe what you say, not what the doctors say. I believe what you say, not what my wife says. Okay. I believe what you say. And God said, that's righteousness right there. You believe me regardless. This is what this principle is all about. The mustard seed of faith is not about, well, let me show you how you get from God what you want. This is how we grow in God. This is how we grow in God. Are you, you guys with me tonight? Then, then we, we look at verse 33. This is all Matthew chapter 13. Just giving you an example of the picture that's being painted through, through the scriptures. He gives us a one verse lesson on the importance of leaven within the bread. Now, there's times when he used leaven in the bread and how it can corrupt the, the, the loaf of bread when he was talking about the Pharisees. On this one, he's not talking about how leaven corrupts. As a matter of fact, he makes this application that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven at work through the church should be a transforming power, a transforming power ability. That's, that's the picture being painted here. When we sow seed and we allow his seed at work in our lives, what should take place is a transformation of the heart before him. Look, get over it. The church is all inclusive. Sorry. It's all inclusive. Everybody, barring Threatening physical harm to people. Everybody is allowed in this church. Are we good with that? But you're never going to hear me affirm any lifestyle. It's all inclusive, but not for affirmation of lifestyles. It's all inclusive with an expectation that lifestyles transform. Amen. We have to get over that. That door is open for anybody that wants to walk through those doors and they're going to be treated with the same love and care and joy because I'm still a work in progress. Amen. Amen. Leaven, the kingdom of heaven should be something that transforms lives. We can't forget this. We can keep our standard high, but keep the door open for anybody that needs life. Amen. Could you imagine needing the assistance of a hospital, of a doctor, and being rejected because you couldn't afford the insurance happens all the time. I'm so thankful the church isn't like that. I'm so thankful that the church is still open to come and receive life and healing and restoration. The church should still be the umbrella we run to and run under when we need help. Can I get an amen? This is, this is seed time and heart. The, the laws of the harvest really aren't about how you get from God what you want. The laws of the harvest are understanding what God's trying to do through us, to us, for us, to build the kingdom of God. Then verse 44, this is, this is an amazing one. He gives this idea. He said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man finds in a field. Think about this. It's kind of weird. Do you, do you have this scripture up here? Look at this. Look at verse 44. 
It's like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. What? And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What? He, he found something he totally valued, buried it into a field, then went and sold everything he had to buy that field because of that treasure. Yeah, this is a description of the commitment towards discipleship. When, when we truly understand, see, the, 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 the truth behind that is they didn't have banks back then. Anything that they had of great value, does anybody know what they did with things of great value? Buried. They buried it in the dirt. That's the only way they could protect it. They couldn't run it down and put it into a bank and, and have that. No, this is of great value. They buried it. All right? So, so he, this man finds a treasure that is obviously something that is worth that field to him. Buries it where he finds it in that field, and then he goes out and he commits everything he has to buy that field because that treasure meant that much to him. This is an idea. The kingdom of heaven is like this. When we understand the value of discipleship, understanding that discipleship, becoming a child of God, costs us nothing outside of faith in him. But when you've truly been transformed in your heart and the Holy Spirit is at work, you fall in love with what being a disciple is and you're willing to pay whatever price you need to pay to grow as a disciple in Christ. Salvation is free. Discipleship will cost you. Are y'all with me? Why do you think the grace message has been so perverted and abused in the body of Christ? Because we exit stage left when we're told about the price for discipleship. We just want whatever's free and then we find out, wait, you oh. Oh, you want me to be a mature Christian? Yeah, it's not good enough just to be a Christian. You want me to be a mature Christian? Mm, I'm out. I, I'm not willing to pay that price. That's what this parable is talking about. The kingdom of heaven is like somebody who finds it, buries it, and goes out and pays whatever price he has to to buy the field. Why? Discipleship is important to him. I, I, I wish I had this perspective 20 years ago. I didn't like discipleship 20 years ago. Can I, can I tell you why? Can anybody guess why I didn't like discipleship? Because of the word that discipleship is built around. Obedience. What? Obedience. No. Discipline. discipline. <laughs> Which is obedience and all. Discipline. <laughs> Nobody likes discipline. I don't like disciplining the body. But if I, if I want a healthy body, I've, I've got to find a way to discipline the body. If I want a healthy body, soul, a healthy spirit, a healthy life. If I want good maturity, I got to become disciplined. Are y'all with me? The cost of discipleship can be much. Then the next 45 and 46 is another one, but it talks about finding uh, pearls. It's, it, there's a phrase called the pearl of great price. We, when, when this one found this, he went out seeking it and found it and it was worth it to him. This is the kingdom of heaven. And then, and then we get to verses 47 through 50, and it speaks about the net that we're going to see at work in the body of Christ. And it, this is a, an end time idea that there's going to be a gathering, a separation, and a judgment. This is the kingdom of heaven. These, these just these little principles that I've thrown out. That's just one chapter where you see over and over the, the picture that's being painted of what the kingdom of heaven will look like. So let's go back to, to Mark. Let's go back to Mark, and I want to work through chapter 4, starting in verse 26, on this specific parable and some things that, that I've seen in this. Am I helping anybody tonight? I don't need you guys to give me a yes to make me feel better. I'm, all, I'm happy with me because I've been reading this all day. Amen. I just need to know that people are getting these principles. Amen. So we, we, we look at verse 26 one more time in Mark chapter 4. And again, this is the intro where he says the kingdom of God is as. And then we get into what the kingdom of God is going to look like. If a man should scatter seed on the ground. Why? In the context of Mark chapter 4, the entire topic of Mark chapter 4 is the importance of the seed and the soil. He has not left that topic. He's now about to add to that topic that this is what the kingdom of God is, is like. 
that why would we expect that God is going to be doing something totally different for the kingdom of God today on earth than what he had been doing for all these years and all these decades and all these centuries and, uh, and generations? Are you hearing me? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And one, one phrase that I, just makes my skin crawl when I hear it, and part of it is because I can't tell you how many times I've said it, and, and I hear it spoken constantly, made reference to it earlier. I'm just going to be honest with you. Nothing causes me to tune out quicker than when somebody leads with God's fixing to. God's about to. And, and then they'll go on some deal where they'll talk about something that most of the time is not even really found in Scripture. It's just an idea. God is about to. God is fixing to. Yeah, no, God isn't doing anything he hasn't been doing for thousands of years. If it's new, it's just new to you. Amen. It's just new to me. I'm not throwing stones. I, I've said it so much in my life. God's about to do this and he's about to do that. Well, maybe the Holy Spirit's about to reveal something to me, but it's not brand new and God didn't just make it up. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if 2,000 years ago he was about sowing seed into soil, and this is how the kingdom of God is built through the process of seed and, and time and harvest of what we're going to get to, why do we keep trying to cut the corner with God and, and speed him up in the process to get what we want out of him? Why can't we just learn the lesson and go with the flow that the Holy Spirit's at work in? Because he knows what he's doing. I don't. Every time I get in the middle of it, it gets off track. I frustrate it. I get ahead of God. I usually hurt myself and people around me because I'm out in front of God thinking that this is the will of God because God's fixing to. Am I talking to anybody tonight? Being practical says God knows what he's doing. There's not one thing that's happened that's caused God to look over at Jesus and go, well, how do you count on that? Wait, let's, let's have a group meeting. Oh, round table discussion, guys. Let's have this little meeting and figure out what we're going to do. No, no. Everything is working according to what he already understands and what he wants. What he's needing is for us to get on his page. Salvation is not us adding Jesus to our life. Salvation is us getting on his page because he knows what he's doing. Can I get an amen? This is like a man scattering seed on the ground. This is what the kingdom of God is like. It's painting a picture. Now, here we go. And it should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, but he himself does not know how. This is important. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, what he's building, what he's growing. I've wasted enough of my time trying to figure out God's process so I can emulate his process and be in charge of things. How's a man saved? Can you lose it? Do you get to keep it? Does it happen here? Does it end here? I don't know. God's the only one that knows the heart. I'm in a spot where we're saved, we're being saved, and we're going to be saved. You want to waste your time working all that out and trying to figure God out? I'm just more interested in introducing people to Jesus Christ and, and getting the process started. Because there's just certain things that we can't figure out. There's just certain things. It just happens. God knows what he's doing. He knows the heart. He knows where they're at. There's not, a, there's not one person in here that comes from the exact same background. Everybody in here has a totally different experience. I may have a conviction in my life right now with the Holy Spirit that you don't have. And I could hurt you if I levy my conviction down upon you. You better be convicted like me. You may be someone that I'm not. You may have a conviction in your life that I haven't gotten yet because we're at a different spot in our walk with God. And I am reserved to say, I'm good to let you do you unless you tell me there's another way to the Father. Then I'm going to put myself in the middle of that quick, fast, in a hurry because that is a primary issue that is a hill that I will die on right now. There's but one way to the Father. The rest of this... We, we, let's just walk it out together. And if I'm missing it, I'll, I'll see it. And if you're missing it, you'll see it. But we in relationship together going toward the Father. Are you with me? And we have great discussions and, and, and sometimes fun debates. But there's certain things that we just, we, we're not going to know. We're, 
why, why would we allow the enemy to create a division between us? Because we're fighting on something that at the end of the day, we really don't know. We, we have an idea. Let's talk eschatology for a minute. Eunice, I don't force my opinion on you. Pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. Do you believe in rapture or no rapture at all? Are you all millennial or are you futurist? Or, or are you, are you uh, somebody that believes that we're in the, the millennial, millennial reign right now? I have my opinions. And if in, in, a, in a protected environment where I know you're not going to be offended at me, I'll tell you what I believe. We can work scripture. But at the end of the day, I don't care who you are. You don't really know. At the end of the day, you have ideas and some scripture, but you don't really know. You know how I know that? Yeah, I, can I just tell you how I know that? How I, how I know that you don't really know? I've worked scripture. I've worked the scripture. I've opened my mind and my heart to it. I've worked it. I've listened to everybody from J J J Dr. Jeremiah all the way to, to, to other names that are in the Reformation that you probably wouldn't have any idea who they are. I've, I've watched and listened to what Calvin had to say. I've listened to what... I, and at the end of the day, I don't know. At the end of the day, they, they all make a pretty good argument. And I feel the Holy Spirit saying, man, you've wasted a lot of time trying to figure out when. And there's people that have been in your life that just need to know me. And so I'm resolved to say, God, I have my ideas. I say, let's hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And do what we're called to do. Amen. Amen. All right, am I helping anybody tonight? But if you want to have a good conversation, let's go to lunch. Let's have a conversation because I'm not saying I don't like eschatology. I love eschatology. I just have offended enough people in my life over it. And I don't want to do that anymore. Amen. And if God's ready for us to know, he'll bring the truth. He will show us. We'll open up the scriptures and we will know. And I've been open to it. Anytime anybody brings something to me that's a, kind of anti what I've taught and, and preached and you've challenged me with a scripture, can I just be honest with you? Not that I lied to you. I'm trying to be honest with you. If you bring something to me that I don't believe and you're asking me to study it, I study it. But I promise you, I, don't, I learned this a long time ago. I don't go into studying trying to prove you wrong. I honestly sit before God and study trying to prove me wrong. Because there's always something on the inside of me. And this will this this help you. There's always that one little voice on the inside of me that says, are you listening to everything, Troy? Are you just holding on to an idea because you want to hold on to it? W what if you've missed something? That, there's always that part of me that says, okay, Father, show me, show me, show me, show me. I would hope that we had all approached the scripture like that. Amen. Are, are you still with me? He says, this thing sprout and grow in the man himself who scattered the seed on the ground. You would think the guy had it figured out. This is how it happens. And this is the, the formula. And this is what we do. And you add it right here and you do it right here. But there's still a measure of this that he himself could not explain exactly how this works. Am I helping anybody? This is where we intro Genesis 8, 22 into this specific parable. Genesis 8, chapter 8, verse 22. It is literally one of the most paramount scriptures to know. It, it is a scripture that you can share with somebody who doesn't even believe in Jesus Christ, and it can still be true to them. Because it's true whether you believe in Jesus or not. It works whether you believe in Jesus or not. It's a law, whether you even believe in God or not. It's a law that people who have rejected the church, but they've made things happen, it's a law that they followed that can still produce to a certain point. Now, we're not talking spiritually now. We're talking in the physical. But it's a law that the Bible leans toward in principle. Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. The world isn't very old after the flood and the restart. God is speaking, and he says, while the earth remains, which we have to understand that this is still applicable today, that the earth, not the saucer that some people think we live on with a dome over it, the earth, the globe, amen, we on a globe, 
I'm just picking for anybody that might be a, a flat earther. I just like to have fun a little bit. While the earth remains, these shall not pass away. So that tells me that as long as you have a tangible surface underneath your feet to walk on, if you believe in flat earth, as long as you have a disc to walk, run around on, or if you believe in the globe, you have a globe you get to go around on. While this remains, these shall not pass away. There's always going to be seasons. You believe in that global warming stuff? No. No. No, not until God's ready. No. No, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm sorry. Your pastor does not believe in all that nonsense. I, no, I don't. Amen. A amen. I don't. Because while the earth remains, there's going to be seasons. <laughs> Prove it. It's right here in Genesis 8.22. There will be hot and cold, summer and winter, day and night. Amen. It, it, to, to, to trace the, the whole global warming idea, eventually you're saying that they're going to upset day and night. No, they can't. They, they can't throw this thing off. Can't do it until God's ready. Are you guys with me tonight? We don't frustrate with that, do we? I mean, I, well, you don't even have to be a, a right-wing conservative to, to understand that there's a calendar we live our life to. How many of y'all got a watch on you right now? Yeah. Is that just jewelry? Or do you actually use that watch? I live on mine. My watch and my phone dialed in. Me and Mickey, we got it going on, right? Right, right, because my, my life is on a schedule. That, that clock is ticking, by the way. I feel Renee going, hurry up. Hurry. <laughs> I, I know some of you are like, oh, man, I got a roast in the oven, right? No, we, 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 we got a schedule. Kids got to get to bed. You got school in the morning. We live our life to a schedule, to a calendar. We, we base everything around th these three principles that we find here in Genesis 8.22. Day and night, summer, winter, hot and cold. We, there's seasons that we do things in the summer, seasons we do things in the spring and in the winter. We have a calendar we live by. We, have, we don't frustrate. Who, who's got to get up by 6 o'clock tomorrow morning and, and be, be on the job? Come on, let me see some hands. 6 o'clock, right? All right, it's 5. 5 o'clock. Okay, so you got to get up at 6 o'clock. Who's getting up at 5.55? Let's just be honest. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, you, you, you got to be up and out the door by 6 o'clock, right? How many of you guys are going to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go outside to make sure things are still in order? No. No. If I've got to be out the door at 6, I'm pushing that envelope until I, can, I absolutely have no left time or time left to do this. Why? I know it's coming. I'm not frustrating whether it's coming or not. It's coming. Yeah. I built my life around it's coming. Are y'all with me? But yet, when it comes to seed time and harvest, we just don't apply that same principle to that. We always act like, well, if it's the will of God. No. We have to understand where we're at today in life is based upon the seed we put in the ground yesterday. Because seed time and harvest is real. You put a seed in the ground, there's going to come a harvest. There's a thing called time in the middle of that. But Genesis 8.22 is important for us to understand the laws of the harvest. Almost done. Have I helped anybody tonight? But seed time and harvest, this is on God's time. This isn't on our time. This is God's time. Verse 28 of, 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 of Mark chapter 4. Brings us to this question. When, we, when, when he says in verse 27, he doesn't know how. He scatters the seed. He does what he's supposed to do, but he still really doesn't know how. Well, the, the answer to the question shouldn't be how. It's really about knowing who. That's what this whole pur purpose is about. Knowing who. The one that's in control of it all. Okay? Verse 28 says, For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then after that the full grain in the head. This is seed time and harvest. This is the process taking place. We can only understand very little of it. And, and so we move to the next point, is the, the, how, how we procure this. What we need to be looking for is when it's ripe. Stop frustrating about how to make it happen and what's going on with the process there. Just literally be ready to, to, to reap it when it comes. But that I deliberately left a gap there between putting the seed in the ground and trusting that God's going to do it and then be ready to reap the harvest. Because the, the point that we're all stuck on, that we tend to get stuck on, is that middle section, that process of time. 
And here's, here's where I go wrong with God all the time. I'm good about putting the seed in the ground. I trust you. I put the seed in the ground. And I've, I've even let go of trying to figure out how that thing's going to happen. I, I, you, you know what you're doing there. And I'm, I'm ready for that harvest. When that harvest comes, I'm preparing for that harvest. My problem is I don't trust the process. I, 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 w- I, want, I want to cut that corner. I, w- I want to speed things up. It, if I could, I'd get the garden going and go and get a bunch of lamps and put it out there. Come on, hurry, 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 hurry. But I know, I've learned, you can't do that. You, you've got to trust the process when it comes to our spiritual walk. The whole purpose of how the kingdom of heaven is like this. Now he's not talking about a physical garden. Now he's talking about you and I. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Put the seed in the ground. Seed's important. We're going to talk about seed. We're going to talk about the importance of seed. What kind of seed, what it does. We need to know seed, right? We're going to talk about how you reap the harvest. How to spot it, how to identify it, position ourselves for it, get ready. Because I believe God is doing something special here on earth. Amen. I'm just going to let you know where I stand. Everybody's praying for revival. And so am I. I believe that there's going to be an end time revival, but I don't believe in the revival that we've been hearing about all this other time. I believe the revival is what's already taken place. There's a renewal for the hunger of the truth of God. People want the word. They want to get away from all the silly stuff. They want the word. And I think there's a revival beginning to take place already before us. People are getting more and more hungry for the word. Are you guys with me? But we keep trying to cut the process. Man, oh, I, can't, I can't stand that time thing. Seed, time, harvest. I'm all about the seed. I'm all about that harvest. Let's get to the harvest. And there's times God saying, <laughs> there's a process. And you're not going to understand all the process. It's not for you to understand the process. Would you just trust me? Would you just sit still and know that you put your seed in the ground, you've prepared the soil, you've done what you're supposed to do. Let me go from here. I'll let you know when that harvest comes. Are you guys with me? We're going to look at the, what we call the laws of the harvest. I promise you there are some principles in there that can change our life when we understand. We are where we're at today because of what we did yesterday. Now, where would you like to be tomorrow with God? Well, you got to let him work this out. Start sowing those seeds. Now, we're going to learn how to identify the seeds because the seed is huge. The soil is important. The process is paramount. The reaping is going to be easy. Amen. Can I pray for you tonight? Father, it's in the name of your son that I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Father, that we can discover rediscover and even re-rediscover the truth in your word and never scratch the surface of its depth. Father, I pray that you've called each one of us, Father, to do something for you in this world, in the body of Christ, in this season, Father, in society and in church, in our homes, and our jobs. And I pray that we would trust you in this process to prepare us, Father, to groom us, to bring us to the purpose in which you've designed each one of us for. I would ask, Father, that we can find a real patience with your word and your process sometimes. Father, I pray that that we can find a way to sit still while while you're working things out. I find, Father, I'd ask that we can find a way to, to surrender. When we're talking about sowing, Father, we're really talking about first and foremost surrendering our hearts to you 100 percent you can work all these other things out father you can help us work through the debates and the discussions and the frustrations and the anger but we've got to give you something to work with and so i i say father that i stand before you i submit my heart to you i submit my mind my body my life to you and ask that you would continue to work on me, help to prepare me, sow seed in my life. It's going to bring my mind where it needs to be, bring my heart where it needs to be, bring, bring my everything, my intentions, my goals, my desires, my passions, all that submitted underneath you. And Father, I pray that all this that's taken place will bring glory and honor to you and you alone. Go with us when we leave tonight. Go before us and prepare a path and bring us back Sunday morning, Father, because we have an expectation 
that you are going to continue to move, continue to teach, continue to grow. It's in Jesus' name that I pray and the church said amen. I love each and every one of you. God bless you. Have a great night.